The following program is brought to you by Total Theater Online. The views expressed do not necessarily represent those of the staff or management of WGBB. You're listening to the station that serves your community, 1240 WGBB. And now it's time for Dave's Gone By with David Lefkowitz. Good early evening, everybody. Welcome to Dave's Gone By. An hour of talk radio, comedy, music, and New Year's Evo coming to you live from Merrick, Long Island. If you've just been listening to Team America, don't flip the dial so quick. You might just like what we do here. This is our 14th show. Here we are in the year, and yes, it's 7.30. Dibs Gone By started back on uh, October 6th as a late night show, 11 o'clock on Sundays. So late, even the crickets were sleeping. Response to the show was good, so when a new slot opened up a few weeks later, we grabbed it, and now the show's on from 7.30 to 9 p.m. Sunday nights. Now, I mean, it's um, the next couple of weeks at least a, a little experiment. The station was kind enough to give me some extra time, an extra half hour, to do the kind of radio I want to do. So for at least the next couple of weeks, Dave's Gone By is going to start at this new time. Still going to run till 9, but I get a little more leeway. More time for music, a little more chance to be off the cuff. I should mention that Don Lewis, too, is in a new time slot. His music and talk show Entertainment Long Island had been on late Sunday nights. But now you can hear the show Saturday nights, 5.30 to 6.30 p.m. It's an old-fashioned program in the best sense of the word. Lighthearted chat about what it takes to be a performer. He has guest song from the entertainment field and live music every week from Eddie Hug and the Moonshiners. So check out Entertainment Long Island, 5.30 to 6.30 Saturday nights on WGBB. As for my show, Dave's Gone By, first off, I want to thank people for their suggestions and their ideas. I've gotten a lot of great feedback, which I certainly listen to, even if I don't automatically agree. One thing is, as the show has gotten smoother, a bit more professional, I hope, more together, it may have lost a little of the spontaneity that I wanted. Many segments are fully scripted, in fact, this one is, and that's a great crutch. It allows me to time things beforehand, to phrase things just right. I hate being caught on the air, searching for a name on the tip of my tongue or blathering too long without a point, like I'm doing now. But the trade-off is that you do lose a little of the spark, a sense that the fellow you're listening to is chatting with you, pulling things out of the air and sharing them at that moment in time, because no other moment would happen exactly the same way. People have told me they can tell when I'm reading and when I'm off the cuff, and they usually prefer the latter, even if it's more scattered, less verbally polished, and more prone to having me go, um, a lot. It seems that unless they're listening to Alan Watts, radio audiences don't want a lecture, they want a conversation. I've also had people tell me I talk too fast, and occasionally mumble the ends of sentences. Now that's something I really want to try and stop doing. So the upshot is, I think the show's been going great, and I couldn't be prouder of how much was accomplished in the first 13 weeks. And much as I'd love to keep honing the pattern of what Dave's Gone By has already become, I also want to take a few more chances, and the extra half hour allows me to do that. So again, I'm very grateful to WGBV for this little New Year's gift, and I hope the results will be both entertaining for you and a learning experience for me. They've given me enough rope. Now let's see if I hang or climb. Anyway, I probably should have said this from the outset, but I'm Dave. Dave Lefkowitz, radio personality playwright, theater critic, journalist, and tireless self-promoter, and my show is really a hodgepodge of comedy, serious talk, and music. You have to listen to the whole thing a few times to get the full sense of it, or at least that's why I tell the Arbitron people. We have recurring segments like The News Gone By, The World Weird Web, interviews and comedy sketches, and an eclectic parade of music. For example, tonight we've got David Bowie, Neil Young, Donovan. We'll be gabbing gabbing about politics and poetry, Boeings, and bowling. We'll have a ticket giveaway, dig this, for the Klezmer Conservatory Band playing Forest Hills on January 19th. So please stick around for the next 85 minutes. Whatever your age, religion, occupation, political beliefs, race, or body shape, just a caution that this is not a show for children. It's a show for grown-ups who want to feel like children and a show for all of us normal, crazy, depressed, happy, miserable, joyous, calm and confused, ordinary, extraordinary people driving or sitting home on a Sunday night who realize that even we can be heroes just for one day.
Bowie, who turns 56 on January 8th, possibly my favorite song in the world, Heroes, an absolutely hypnotic track, Brian Eno providing the soundscape, Bowie the somewhat cryptic lyrics, the dolphin bit always struck me as kind of silly, but that amazing balance between exaltation and despair gets me every time. And stick around because we will again zero in on Heroes later tonight. We'll also have the news gone by coming up in a few minutes, but first, please listen to this. Here's a new segment called Dave Goes Off, 
No, it's not the station owners kicking me off the air in favor of China, Chinese gospel yet. It's a segment where I get to rant about things, give my opinion, throw some thoughts out there, and hope to hear back from you. Think of it as Dennis Miller Light or maybe Larry King Heavy. Either way, tonight's inaugural segment is about sports, basketball, skiing, and bowling. And just the fact that I think about bowling scares me a little. But don't worry, I'm not going to get into an FAN-style tirade about minutia. Just some things that have been on my mind. Remember a month or so ago, when we had a news gone by story about one soccer team getting so upset over a referee's call, they just kept kicking the ball into their own goal until they lost, like, a hundred to nothing. Well, this is almost more pathetic. According to the Associated Press, Walkerville High School girls basketball team in Michigan beat their opponents, the girls of Hart Lakeshore Public Academy, 115 to 2. Now, everyone expected Walkerville to beat Lakeshore, a school with only 50 students and their team hadn't won a single game this season. But the final numbers incensed Lakeshore Academic Director Steve Hamilton. He accused Walkerville of ungracious behavior. He said, quote, To me, if you run up the score like that, you have to answer for yourself. I have doubts about a school that would go and run up another school by a hundred points. Now that led Walkerville's coach to counter that his team held back. They could have scored more. But they purposely used mostly junior varsity and freshman players. They didn't press on defense and they backed off from going for the state record for points in a game, 151. Not only that, by halftime, three girls on Walkerville's team hadn't scored. So the coach said only they could shoot and no one else could. And still, they beat Lakeshore 115 to 2. I'm not saying Lakeshore is a lousy team, but in the middle of the third quarter, the crowd started chanting, let's go Nuggets. But seriously, I'm, I'm with the winning team's coach on this. I don't even think he has to give all these caveats or say, well, we tried all these things to limit ourselves and give the other team a chance. No. You tell a team of any sport to go out and win. Play hard, play fair. And if the object of the game is to score points, you score points. I mean, when Michael Jordan would score 50 or so points in his games with the Bulls, did the crowd turn away and go, nah, you should have stopped at 40, it's unseemly. And I bring this up because I really don't understand this anti-winning big philosophy, like you have to keep the other team in the game just to make things interesting. One of my favorite newspaper writers ascribes to this, Phil Mushnick in the New York Post. He's the best thing in the paper, a smart very readable sports columnist and a rather severe moralist. For years, he's been hammering away at, at uh, corruption in college basketball, steroid use in pro sports, and the way baseball has deteriorated because of greed and TV contracts. He chastises sportscasters who avoid asking tough questions, color commentators who say dumb things, and then say even dumber things to defend the dumb things they just said. Phil Mushnick goes after them all again and again. He's repetitive, but he's also a very bracing, no-nonsense, often pessimistic writer. But there's always a sense that he has a glimmer of hope that things could improve, that it all hasn't gone into the toilet. But Mushnick also pisses and moans about things I'm a little less black and white about. He's severely anti-gambling, which I think is overkill. He tears into what he calls useless or misleading statistics, things like, well, the Giants have gone 3 for 13 in third-down conversions in the last three home games played before sundown on a leap year, Mushnick believes pointless stats detract from the game. I don't know. I think the guys in the booth are just trying to add nuggets of information to the broadcast so the sportscasters have something to say rather than just tell what's visually apparent. But okay, getting back to this whole running up the score thing. Mushnick has a buck up his butt about that too. He al he's always saying it's bad sportsmanship. It's like grandstanding or insulting the other team. And I respect Mushnick's opinion, but I still think he's wrong, just as I think the Lakeshore coach was wrong. When you go out and do something, anything, you want it to be the best. And if you're a hundred times better than your opponent, well, it's his job to try and improve or to just accept that you're going to be him 115 to 2. If two French restaurants open up in the same neighborhood, and one is sensational, world class, and the other is dumpy and gives most of its patrons diarrhea, should the great restaurant downgrade its quality so as not to put the other eatery out of business? The only reason to cool it down when you're running away with a score is when you want to spare your players for the next game. And it's the baseball playoffs, and you got a great pitcher, and the team's winning 15-4 to 4 in the eighth inning, you take the pitcher out because you might need him again on three days rest. 
If it's a football team winning 50 to 12 with 12 minutes to go, real garbage time. You spare your quarterback and most important players because there's always the danger of a bone crushing hit or a twisted ankle. But otherwise, high scores are fair game so long as you play a fair game. And remember, even though it doesn't happen very often, every sport has its miraculous comebacks even at the last minute. Game four of the 1996 World Series. The Yankees down two games to one, down six to nothing in the sixth inning, battle back, win the game and the series. Look at the Jets this year. One and four, last place, playing like a team off the schoolyard. Horrendous. And every week, the coaches, the players, having to read the sportscasters and columnists, writing them off, flushing them down the toilet. And then what happens? New quarterback, new spirit, more determination. They keep trying, win a couple of games. Still have a setback or two, win more games. End up at 500. End up better than 500. Make the playoffs by winning the division. And they just won the first playoff game yesterday by a snug margin of 41 to nothing. Unlikely as hell, but it really happened. The moral, and hang over till it's over. So, till it's over, keep playing like it's just begun. Well, that's my opinion. I want to hear yours. So if you want to give me a call in the next few minutes and speak your piece on the air with me, the number is 516-819-3742. Area code 516-819-3742. I can take phone calls on the air for this segment between now and 8 o'clock, so it's 819-3742, and to sweeten the deal, because I know a lot of people are shy about calling into radio stations, if you call in and say the secret word, mushnik, you'll win a pair of tickets to see the Klezmer Conservatory Band at Forest Hills Jewish Center, 8 o'clock, Sunday night, January 19th. Yeah, that's right. If you win the tickets, you'll actually be spared listening to my show in two weeks, because at 8 o'clock on January 19th, You'll be at 106-06 Queens Boulevard in Forest Hills hearing one of the most famous klezmer ensembles in the country. Hankos Netsky leads the 11-piece band, which really spearheaded the klezmer revival movement in the early 1980s. They have about a dozen albums out, mostly on the Vanguard and Rounder Records labels, and they've been on Prairie Home Companion, they've recorded with Yitzhak Perlman and the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, and they backed Joel Gray in his Yiddish musical review, Borscht Capades 94. I know, but they're good anyway. So call me at 516-819-3742, say the secret word Mushnik, and you can win two tickets to the Klezmer Conservatory Band at Forest Hills Jewish Center, January 19th. We have three pair we can give away tonight, so if the line's busy, keep calling in. And if you don't want to go on the air and talk about the whole basketball scoring thing with me, that's fine. Just tell uh, whoever picks up the phone that you're only calling in for the giveaway. You don't want to be on the radio. You must be 15 years of age or older. No direct family members of me or anyone at GBB. Otherwise, whoever wants to call in and say the secret word, Mushnik, will put you on hold for a minute and then give you the information. Also, if you do want to be on the air, now till 8, I'm here. 819-3742. Now, before I talk about bowling or uh, talk to whoever, if anyone calls in, I do want to mention a story about skiing. This is from the Associated Press about a group of skiers who got lost on the trails at Mad River Glen in Faston, Vermont. It happened last Sunday. Jeffrey Rosemarin of Huntington, New York, called police on his cell phone to say he and his two sons and their friend were lost on the trail. A bunch of search and rescue teams were called, and they found the group unharmed a little after midnight. Not a big deal story, except that Jeffrey Rosemarin is my cousin. I know him and his family very well. And it's also true, no joke, that Jeffrey's dad was a championship skier who was killed about a decade ago in an avalanche. Yes, I actually have a relative who was killed in an avalanche. Now, you would think this would put a damper on the sport for the Rosemarins, but no, they're ski fanatics. Um, oh, by the way, uh, apparently there's a different number for the call-in, sorry, I don't know where I got the number that I gave, but I should have given, 955-1240. 955-1240, area code 516, if you want to call in and talk to me. Um, so I'm trying to read my engineer's lips, and I can't really... He said, what is the engineer saying? Come on, talk to me. The engineer, his name is Stan. And Hi, Stan. If you're calling by cell phone at 631-955-1240, if you're calling from your home phone, it's 516 516- Nine five five twelve forty. Can you tell? Can you tell it stand does like a hip hop and soul and and uh, and that Old kind of R&B. show? 
And he's like an 80-year-old white guy. It's really frightening. No, I'm just kidding. Um, but getting back to the Rosemarins, my cousins, um, and skiing. Another fella I was working with at a magazine about 15 years ago, he'd go skiing pretty much every weekend all winter long. And one time he came in with a sling on his arm. And I was like, dude, what happened? And he said, I fell and broke my arm skiing. It really hurts. But what upset him most is that he had to stay off the slopes for two months. I can't wait to get back on skis again, he said. That's an actual quote. Now, granted, I have never been on a pair of skis, so I don't know what I'm missing. But from my very uh, admittedly narrow perspective, I do feel that Jews should not ski. It's a very Jackie Mason opinion, I know, but the closest any Jew should get to a steep slope is looking at the nose of another Jew. I'm kidding, I'm kidding, and I'm Jewish, I can make these jokes, but seriously, Cousin Jeffrey, I'm glad you're okay, and I hope you're giving some serious thought to a basketball, or golf, or ice skating if you like the cold so much. And if you're just trying to prove that you can live like wealthy Gentiles, you don't have to ski, just pour yourself a gin and tonic, eat some Wonder Bread with Kraft mayonnaise on it, and buy yourself a quilt from the Land's End catalog. Don't even have to leave your house. Anyway, reminding you that the number for the tickets and calling is 516-955-1240. want to talk a little bit extemporaneously about bowling. I uh, went for the second time in ages bowling locally with a friend of mine. And uh, happy to see that it was very crowded with, of course, lots of parents and kids. And the previous time we went, it was a police athletic uh, league thing. So it's obviously taken on a popularity that you wouldn't necessarily believe it had if you consider how people make fun of it or it's assumed to be this lower middle class, blue collar, honeymooners sort of sport. And that really is very misleading because I remember when I was a kid, I would go bowling pretty much once a week and I'd get up there and bowl about six or seven games. And I'd do lousy for the first two games, then I'd really build up. And then fifth and sixth games were kind of a wind down. But in the middle there, I do in the 150s, 160s. I think my high score at one point was a 216. Yeah, I, this is my show. I get to brag a little. But um, I could get out of there and I'd have a vanilla egg cream for under $10. I mean, the whole thing, two hours, boom. I go with my friend now. Do you know it's like $4.50 a game? And I think it's four seventy-five in peak times, although it always seems to be peak times there. So... Figuring you want to bowl three or four games, it gets almost as expensive as playing a round of nine-hole golf at the local course. So, so much for this kind of lower middle classy thing. Aside from the fact, okay, I can understand, you know, you've got staff, you've got lights, you've got everything's got to be maintained, so that's why it costs so much for a game. But shoes, shoes that you rent, which I think used to be about 75 cents, maybe 50 cents, are now 250 they spritz a little Lysol in them, and they keep reusing shoes over and over again. For, and granted, they've got Velcro, which is a much better idea than the old lacy things, but I don't think Velcro costs that much. Anyway, um, I do love bowling, and I bowled a 145 on New Year's Day. Not bad for a guy who hasn't done it in years. And I want to close this little part of the segment by saying anyone who thinks bowling is not an aerobic sport, is just kind of a pastime, Go bowling if you haven't gone in a long, long time. And then bowl three games. But really do it. Don't just, you know, saunter up to the lane and drop the ball on your foot and kick it forward. I mean, really try and bowl in proper fashion. And then check your body out the next day. There will be things that hurt on you that you don't even know you had in you. So um, I'm, I'm much more convinced that bowling has, has more to it than, uh, than you'll see about, you know, these John Goodman-type guys guzzling it back in the Big Lebowski. Okay, we've got to move on to the next segment. You can still call in off the air for the Klezmer tickets from now till the rest of the show. Thanks, nobody, for calling in. <laughs> I guess it is Sunday night. Uh, 819-3742, January 19th at Forest Hills Jewish Center. Definitely go for it. Um, that wasn't, I gave the wrong number again. Jeez. 516-955-1240 if you have a cell phone. 631 631- 955-1240. Um, remember to tell the engineer the secret word mushnik. Uh, ask for your name, phone number, and email address. You just have to show up at the theater with your ID on the night of the show to claim your prize. Well, folks, if you're just tuning in, regular listeners and new listeners, this is Dave's Gone By, an hour of talk radio, music, and comedy. We started a little early this week, 7.30, but we're still running until 9 p.m., and we'll be doing that for the next couple of weeks. I'm not sure how long at this point, but we're experimenting, tinkering with the format, so at least temporarily, 
We're on from 7.30 to 9 on Sunday nights, a full 90 minutes. So if you like the show, there's just that much more of me to love. And if you don't like the show, well, some of that extra time, I'll be playing more music. Like right now. This being the first show of 2003, here we are in the new year, with the world still moving too fast, with our ecosystem still threatened, with our lives still becoming careers, this is Neil Young from his first solo album, circa 1969, and you know, nothing's changed. Now that the holidays have come, they can relax and watch the sun rise above all of the beautiful things they've done. Take the dog, look at the sky without the small. See the world, laugh at the farmers feeding hogs. Eat hot dogs, what a pity that the people from the city can't relate to the slow. Spreading the news, there's a new magazine in town with the latest stories and reviews about everything on stage, on and off magazine. It's a glossy, full-color guide to theater, dance, comedy, and cabaret in New York City. The best part is, it's free. You can find on and off around town at theaters, restaurants, hotels, and community and information centers. Visit www.onandoffstage.com for more information, and let on and off be your guide. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. It's time for the news gone by, a look at events of the past week from a happy new perspective. On the political front, Newsday reports that more than a third of the people newly elected to Congress, 27 out of 63 freshman congressmen, are millionaires. Not only that, several have more than $15,000 invested in banking, credit card, pharmaceutical, and oil companies. Fourteen of the incoming reps took a pay cut for their new jobs. And for those of you who still believe in Santa Claus, there's this soundbite from Representative-elect Jeb Bradley, whose net worth ranges between uh, one and five million dollars, depending on the stock market that day. The New Hampshire Republican said, quote, I don't believe you can, as a member of Congress, use your influence to benefit yourself. Asked by reporters to elaborate, Bradley tried to say more, but he was too busy doubled over laughing. Tragic New Year's Eve news from Veracruz, Mexico. 
A chain of stalls selling illegal fireworks exploded in a crowded market, killing 28 people and wounding nearly 50 more. The flames and fireballs sent victims through the air and scattered body parts hundreds of feet. Film crews caught the terrifying event, including scenes of, pol of police trying to comfort orphan children by telling them, Look, your daddy's imitating a piñata! In science news, behavioral biologists have discovered that lobsters have an internal homing device, giving them uncanny abilities to find their way home. Nature magazine reports that a recent study on Caribbean spiny lobsters in the Florida Keys shows them to have a kind of magnetic compass. The lobsters were tested in situations where they couldn't rely on familiar odors or the direction of sunlight coming through the water, yet they still managed to make their way back. The, this finding has added fuel to demands by ecologists that Palestinian lobsters have the right of return to the Dead Sea. Israeli scientists counter this as unfair, since the lobsters are predators with sharp claws, they're unkosher, and they play badly with herring. Humanitarian aid has been brought to the region in the form of giant terrines of drawn butter. On the international front, Kenya, Africa, has a new president. Opposition leader Mwai Kibaki beat 24-year incumbent Daniel Arap Moy for the top slot, ending nearly four decades of rule by the same party. New President Kibaki promised to end the incredible amount of corruption that's weakened Kenya's economy to almost desperate levels. The scandal and bribery have gotten so bad there, even the famed Nairobi trio has refused to perform without extra bananas, a crate of Havana cigars, and $50 bills tucked into their wigs. Just a reminder, we have tickets to give away for the Klezmer Conservatory Band at Forest Hills Jewish Center, January 19th. Call the station at 516-955-1240 and say the secret word, Mushnik, 516-955-1240. Entertainment news. On December 30th, Diana Ross, the Supreme Supreme, was arrested for drunk driving in Tucson, Arizona. Police gave the 58-year-old singer a breathalyzer test, and she came up 0.2. Now that's double the old legal limit, let alone the new limit of 0.08. That allowed the cops to charge Ross not only with driving under the influence, but extreme DUI. That's reserved for people with a blood alcohol level higher than 0.15%. Although Ross needs to stop in the name of Lush, I do think the sobriety test was a little unfair to the singer. <laughs> my, my engineer Stan is laughing. According to E! Online News, Ross was unable to recite the alphabet. 
she skipped the letters I and N and added extra C's, L's, and S's. Then again, for someone who went to a Detroit public high school, that's actually pretty good. When she tried to stand on one leg, she toppled over after only seven seconds and then laughed about it, saying, Ha ha ha! Great! Which, ironically, is also the answer to the question, What is Diana Ross? And what was Diana Ross? It's been a downhill slalom for the singer-actress this past couple of years. In 2000, her supposed reunion tour with the Supremes tanked because she was too cheap or egotistical to actually reunite with the other Supremes. A few months later, she split with her husband of 14 years, and this past May, she checked into Promises, a drug and alcohol rehab center in Malibu. Still, a spokesperson for Ms. Ross said her client is only doing all of this as a preparation for her latest movie, The Whitney Houston Story. Speaking of drugs, the Air Force is once again under scrutiny for the accidental bombing that killed four Canadian soldiers in Afghanistan last April. The pilot, Major Harry Schmidt, was on night patrol and spotted a flash of weapons near Kandahar. Although he was told by an AWAC radar plane not to engage, Schmidt mistook the military exercises for enemy fire and bombed away. Now he's facing court-martial, and his lawyer is saying Schmidt's judgment was impaired because he was exhausted, but instead of allowing him to get a little R&R, his superiors just made him take some amphetamines. It's apparently a common practice for soldiers fighting fatigue to take dexedrine, nicknamed go-no-pills, to keep them alert and edgy. Dexies were apparently popped like candy during the Gulf War, and I wonder whether this is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to standardized drug use in the armed forces. If that's true, I do have some recommendations for other drugs the military could take, depending on the crisis at hand. For example, if there's a firefight in a pretty place like Jerusalem or West Africa, two tabs of LSD will make the whole thing look so groovy. If we have to take on a superpower like China, a few steroids should give our boys that WWF kick-ass machismo that America's famous for. If terrorism strikes and the National Guard is dispatched to malls and major cities in America, a little Valium should help take the edge off all those blinking lights and pushy crowds. And if we have to go separate India and Pakistan, a few Viagra pills should help keep the cadets from wilting in the desert sun. And remember, there is precedent for giving drugs to the military. We wouldn't ask our boys to do anything our government wouldn't do, and it's obvious from their policies that George Bush, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and John Ashcroft are all on crack. On the technology front, China has installed the world's first railway system working entirely on the principles of magnetic levitation. The train, which zips between the Shanghai Financial District and Pudong Airport, can reach a speed of 260 miles per hour. That's faster than a World War II fighter plane. The subway cost a whopping $2.1 billion. But if all goes well with future development, you could make the 800-mile journey from Shanghai to Beijing in less than three hours. The only problem is, an hour after you get to the capital, you want to start back at Shanghai again. Speaking of China, there was a cool story in the New York Times a couple of weeks ago about delegates from the Chinese government visiting Manhattan to see and study Broadway musicals. For six days, the Deputy Director General of the Department of Arts Management of the Chinese Ministry of Culture whew, took in a slew of big-budget musicals. They were especially taken with special effects and dazzling sets, like the swimming pool in Aida and the sewer lagoon in Phantom of the Opera. They were confused by the story of Mamma Mia!, which only goes to show that some things truly are universal. Explaining his mission, the deputy told the Times, quote, We don't want to know how your, we want to know how your Broadway musicals could attract such large audiences, and why our comprehensive art forms with singing, dancing, and drama could not attract such a large audience. Attendance at state-supported opera houses has dwindled, as other pastimes have captured the youth market. To their credit, when Chinese are trying to learn from different cultures and apply the best techniques to their homegrown product. The irony is that I could have saved the delegation their expensive trip to New York, because it's really pretty simple. For proof that there's no money in or audience for traditional Chinese entertainment, <laughs> just look at this radio station. But seriously, on an aesthetic level, Broadway musicals sound like this. The cowboys, the wrestlers, the tumblers, the clowns, the roustabouts that move the show at dawn. 
the music, the spotlights, the people, the towns, your baggage with the labels pasted on, the sawdust and the horses and the smell, the towel you've taken from the last hotel. There's no business like show business, like no business I know. Everything about it is a piece of okay. That's, that's how Broadway musicals sound. Chinese musicals sound like this. Okay. That's, that's Broadway. That's Broadway. This is Chinese. Now, I realize this is a difficult concept. So once more, this is a Broadway show. Okay. Now, if, if you mix that with Chinese opera, it's, it's going to sound something like this. Oh, no! The headaches, the heartaches, the backaches, the blocks, oh, no. the sheriff who escorts you out of town, oh, no. the opening when your heart beats like a drum. Okay, okay, so there are subtle differences if you listen carefully. I do hope that there is a cross-fertilization of ideas here, and that in a few years we'll be seeing such Broadway-style shows in Beijing as The Red Pajama Game, Tea and Sympathy and More Tea, Say Goodnight Glacy, and of course Cats, which in their case would be Dinner Theater. And that's the news gone by for January 5th, 2003. Send in your comments, opinions, and fortune cookies to Dave's Gone By, P.O. Box 62, Hewlett, New York, 11557-0062, or email us at davesgoneby at aol.com. Please, no dexies. I already have two doxies. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By, and uh, this is the segment we call Dave's Got Guests. Well, one guest anyway. A uh, good old friend of mine, Mr. David Pace, theater critic and flight attendant. Kind of uh, somewhat odd, coincidental Two jobs at once sort of thing, but um, oh. because we met through American what? Theater Critics Association, right, which we both belong to. It's an organization that puts theater critics uh, from all over the country together once or twice a year. We see shows, we discuss, we argue, we grab with each other, we eat, we eat, we, we eat a we lot. We gain a lot of weight. And uh, then we go away and forget about each other for half a year, and then we see each other again. Yeah. But we hooked up because you know, you're, you're wonderful people. I know your, your lovely wife, Cheryl. Thank you. And you've been living in Brooklyn for many years. Seven. Seven years. Seven years. Before that, Salt Lake City. Salt Lake City, which is where I'm from, or that area. Mm -hmm. And aside from being a theater critic, which you don't do that much anymore now. Correct. You're basically a... Flight attendant. Or a steward. A steward, yes. (laughs) Which do you prefer? Actually, uh, we were talking about this the other day uh, with the flight attendant. Um, I think steward has a nicer ring to it, so you can call me. Actually, technically, though, I am a flight attendant. Technically, you're a flight Okay. How long have you been doing that? been doing that for 17 and a half years now. Oh, my gosh. What made you choose that as opposed to, like, pilot or something else? Well, I didn't have the training for a pilot, but um, I was out of college, and I was actually lifeguarding at the time, and this very adorable young thing who was sitting uh, on the deck Ah. And I said, hey, you look like somebody I know at the airline that I work for. I, I didn't even know what a flight attendant was. You didn't have to at that moment. No. Yeah. <laughs> I was like, no, I want to be where you are. So anyway, that's uh, I went to uh, the cattle call, as they say, for Western Airlines. That was uh, who I was working for at the time. Got hired, and or rather, that's where I applied and got hired. And Delta Airlines bought us out two, and, two years later, and here I am. I thought I was just going to do it for a year and a half, you know. But you got... Either to like it or used to it because why? What were the good things? Well, about it's it? a very seductive job in many ways. I mean, other than the beautiful flight attendants yeah. that you get to work with, uh, uh-huh. um, you know, it's it's the sort of thing where you go to work every day and you're working with different people every day, and uh, or, or at least a pool of flight attendants. So you don't work with the same people every day, and every time you get out of your quote unquote office, you're in a different city. So a lot of travel benefits, opportunities that way. Have you, do you get to really enjoy the travel, though, or is it you're in a city for about five minutes and you're off to the airport, you sleep, and then it's back on a plane back to LaGuardia? Well, here in, in Kennedy, which is where I work out of, I fly international. So I get a 24 to 48 hour layover in a foreign city, which is, you know, substantial time to... To see something. See something and have dinner and 
figure out that you don't speak Czech very well and that sort of thing. Yeah, but it's it, it is long enough to you know get a taste of where you're traveling to. Well, what are some of the oddest um, or most exotic places that you've been able to go to through being a flight attendant? Hmm, that's a good question. Um, I think probably my favorite city next to Paris oh, wow. would have to be uh, Prague, and we flew there for many years and. Prague is gorgeous. Really enjoyed that. That, in fact, I, I think you. I remember your visiting there years ago, wasn't it for a, uh, yeah. America, a critics conference? Actually, no, that wasn't. That was just uh, through friends. It was, oh, was it? All different. Because I know you traveled in uh, yeah. Europe. But I remember that. thinking I didn't like the people of Prague so much, but the, the city was like a story book. It was magnificently beautiful. Right, right. I guess it it was spared the bombing during the World War Two. So well, certainly, yeah. yeah. Um, but any uh, any places even more so? Well, but those are very almost European continental cities. Yeah, that's true. Cities. I I haven't uh, f- I ha- I've actually been to Nepal, which is probably the most exotic All place right. I've been to. That's cool. And I didn't actually work. The f- we used to fly to Bangkok, and that was as close as we could get to Nepal in terms of um, you know Delta Airlines flying there. But I did go to I did go trekking for three weeks. Oh, so that was almost like a vacation thing. Yeah, it was more of a vacation. Um, and I think. Th- the other, uh, I would have to, you know, I fly exclusively Europe, really, out of New York, so I can't really speak to any other areas outside of Europe or the Middle East. I, I love Tel Aviv. We used to fly there before September oh, wow. 11th, and, um, you know, I used to really enjoy being in that culture. Um, well, a given, a given week for you, or maybe two-week period, uh, what is your schedule like? Is it almost like doctors in training where you're going... 48, 72 hours straight, and then you get four hours of sleep, and then you're back, and then, or, or do they work it out differently? Well, for us, out of Kennedy anyway, we fly one leg usually over to Europe, and we have a 24-hour layover there, and then just usually one leg back. So that's a, a three-day trip because you have a 24-hour right. layover in Europe, and then we have four days off typically, three to four days uh, bef- before so we do it So you basically have again. one flight a week. One uh, flight a week over... Yeah, one round trip. Yeah, well, that's, that's, that sounds will. pretty sweet. That's not bad at all. Yeah. And that's a full-time gig. That's a full-time gig. Now, if I were to do it, I can do domestic. That's a very different operation where you're flying sometimes four to five legs in one day, little hops all around Ooh. the country. Okay. And then you have a shorter layover, maybe 16 hours or even as, as low as nine hours before you have to get back up and do it again. So, yeah, I think the international flying is a, is a completely different animal. I much prefer it. Even though you're flying all night, sometimes you have sometimes a 15-hour day. Mm. You know that can be kind of taxing sometimes. But you know, when it's over, you've got four a, a long weekend, no matter what. You know, as soon as you get back to when I get back to New York, yeah, I've typically got four days off, which is great for somebody like myself who is uh, an aspiring writer, and um, I'm doing more fiction now, which right. requires more, I think, focus, How's lengths it? of time. Just a little side thing. How is the book going? Um, not too well. <laughs> oh, wonderful. <laughs> I've got the manuscript. I got an agent. I don't know if I told you that. No, no, congratulations. I did have an agent. And uh, uh, about the time that September 11th hit was when she dropped me. So oh. uh, I think the entire publishing industry was in kind of a a tailspin at the time. And anyway, I like to think that's the reason why she dropped me. I like to think <laughs> that the book is still marketable. But, um I, I guess I, I wanted to get to this a little later, but since it's sure. rearing its ugly head, it, let's it's go rearing, to 9/11. Yeah, ugly with all the uh, all the hairs growing out of the nose. <laughs> yeah, no, I didn't mean the book. I mean nine <laughs> eleven. How has that changed not only your life as a flight attendant, but I guess all your colleagues, pilots, as well as, as everybody else? Well, I think the biggest reason, other than just operationally, the changes that we've gone through that all of us experience when we go to the airport now, it's. Um, it's tough going to work in a police state, which is, I think, what what the airports have become. And now that uh, the new federalized screeners are in place, maybe it'll get a little bit more uniform, a little bit more um, less threatening. But for a while there, during that transition, you had no idea what to expect when you went to the airport in terms of just getting through security. In terms of being a flight attendant, it's yeah. tough getting on an airplane now and having to look through you know, the entire galley area and sometimes cabin areas um, looking for bombs, basically. And You actually go looking f- to see... To hear at, the be- at the beginning of a flight, yeah. At the beginning of an international flight. The first flight of the day, we're, 
were required to do that. Have so, you ever found anything? No. Or any contraband or any drugs or any, you know, any s weird stuff? I haven't, knock on wood. But um, basically we're being asked to think like a terrorist. You know, where would a terrorist put a bomb on this and then you serve can. coffee. <laughs> and then I go out and smile and serve coffee. Yeah, I put my tie on and away we go. So it's kind of, you know, yeah, it is a little jarring that way. It's kind of two jobs. You're a policeman, an amateur policeman, and, you know, they're teaching us self-defense now. When when I went through training 17 years ago with Western Airlines, it was how to serve a cup of coffee or a cocktail. But Well, um, I do want to go there because, sure. okay, before the whole 9-11 thing, you're still a flag attendant. You're still dealing in the air. There's no way to stop the plane in the middle and let people off by parachute. What do you do with someone who has had eight drinks and is out of control or irate or crazy? Or wh What do you do? Well, that's a good question. I mean, we do have a limited... In fact, we have no access to the cockpit anymore. The cockpit cannot help us right. once we're in the air. Um, that's a, what they call a sterile cockpit, and it's not to be... You know, They're not to come out of the cockpit for obvious reasons right. now. So it's left to us and the passengers that we can recruit to help us. Um, I did have an incident coming out of Copenhagen a few years ago where a man was having an emotional breakdown. He was a heavy smoker and was not able to smoke on the airplane, mm -hmm. so we don't allow that anymore. And um, he was threatening the flight attendants. He was disoriented. He was throwing his food around. And you know we had to make the choice as to whether or not we were going to go back to Copenhagen or continue on to New York. And as it was, this is before September 11th, the captain came out and handcuffed him. Oh. And uh, and uh, planted two huge Danish guys, one on each side of him, and decided to go on to New York. Um, so these were just Danish people on the who happened to be on the flight. Yeah, uh, the guys that that kept an eye on him. Sure, uh, we had to kind of marshal their support. But either, it was either that or turn around and go back to yeah. Copenhagen. But um, you know that does happen occasionally. And actually, as a follow up to that story, sure. this guy actually bit the captain when he was handcuffing him. And Ooh. Um, was so it was pretty ugly. As as he the was taken into custody, and you know, once that happens, the FBI gets involved, and we all had to be interviewed, and it was a big, big hassle. But you know, you just you're in a small contained place, and you have no idea who's really on that airplane sometimes, and you just have to roll with it. You know, most of the time we can placate people or uh, you know mollify them in some way so that they're not d a danger to the rest to the other people in the cabin. And I think flight attendants should you know can be. Uh, are said to have some some pretty terrific skills that way. I think that's what we're we're designed. Yeah. I think I think for in that way. W one last question. Sure. Um, and it's funny that because of nine eleven, we keep talking about the dangers of the people and and what are the pilots and and are they able? Can they carry guns at this point or no? But I think it's it's passed Congress, hasn't it? So I think it has. They yeah. will eventually. They will but be. In the old days, Which I'm scares sure the crap out of me. <laughs> 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 I don't think I want the pilots with guns. Especially, you know, you're in the air and you shoot through the plane. I mean, <laughs> well, and what what happens if what happens if he comes out to go to the bathroom? He or she comes out to go to the bathroom and 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 the gun gets into the hands of a passenger who's a lunatic, you know. I mean, I don't know. It's just, I know there's pro and con, but... But before I, all I don't this, all before we... Were, that was the thing. We were so worried about the people. Now, in the old days, I assume the question was, well, gosh, I mean, you're flying every week. Yeah, Aren't you afraid of a storm? Aren't you... Mm -hmm. Have you ever had these, these things where the plane dips like yeah. 20,000 feet in two seconds? Have you had one of those really terrifying experiences? You know, it's funny you should say that, because last week we were uh, flying to Los Angeles and working the flight, and we had terrific turbulence, probably the worst turbulence I've experienced in 10 years. And, it, yeah, it's pretty scary. Depending on what airplane it is, uh, you know, you can get some pretty bad turbulence in the back of it, especially. Um, but, yeah, the big concern now is more p who's on the airplane. That's where we're looking um, for possible problems. But, yeah, there, there's some mechanical concerns. But, you know, at any one moment, there's 60,000 people in the air over the United States. So you have to realize that still, even after 9-11, you know, you're still safer on an airplane than you are, than we were in the car today driving over here to the radio station. Well, well, David Pace, I felt, hope you have felt safe talking to me on <laughs> my show. <laughs> well, I do have some handcuffs that I may have to, no. I'm I'll, I'll, I'll uncuff you later, <laughs> maybe. David Pace, thanks for joining us on Dave's Gone By. It's a pleasure, thanks. Welcome back to Dave's Gone By. Time for a gentle birthday salute to two poets born on the same day this coming week. Khalil Gibran, born in 1883, and Carl Sandburg, born in 1878, both on January 6th. Khalil Gibran was born in Bashari, Lebanon, to a lower middle class family and an angry, difficult father who was jailed before the boy reached his teens. 
Jabran's mom took her four kids to Boston, where Khalil learned English and developed his drawing skills. Still holding fast to his Arabic culture, Jabran moved back to Lebanon for a few years of study, but he returned to Boston when he was 19. He'd lose his mom and two siblings to tuberculosis, but otherwise things started looking up for him. He began a lifelong friendship slash unrequited romance with a Boston headmistress, and by 1905 had already published a few essays. Books of prose poetry in Arabic followed, as did a cultural awakening to philosophy and painting and aesthetics. He met people like Carl Jung, Abdul Baha, the leader of the Baha'i Faith, and William Butler Yeats. In 1918. Jabran's first book in English, *The Madman*, was published, and it launched him into a whole new literary circle. 1923's *The Prophet* was something of a sensation, and still is his best-known book. He wrote more in the 1920s, but he also dabbled badly in real estate, became ill, drank heavily despite prohibition, and he lived only until 1931. He became a name again in the 1960s when hippies got into Eastern philosophies and intellectual discourses about love and religion. No doubt they were drawn to Jabran's simple, spare writing style. Think of it as the King James version of flower power, and Jabran's use of parables and wise visionaries gently telling seekers how to live must have appealed mightily to suburban kids having screaming fights with their parents over haircuts, miniskirts, and the Rolling Stones. It seems to me a lot of Gibran's philosophy deals with the duality of mankind: what we say and what we keep hidden, what someone can teach us, and what we have to learn for ourselves. Here's a very short piece from *The Wanderer*, a Gibran work published posthumously in 1932. Again, it's the whole duality thing. This one's kind of like the story of the blind man and the elephant, only a tad more wistful. It's called *Tears and Laughter*. Upon the bank of the Nile at eventide, a hyena met a crocodile, and they stopped and greeted one another. The hyena spoke and said, "How's the day going with you, sir?" And the crocodile answered, saying, "It goes badly with me. Sometimes in my pain and sorrow I weep, and then the creatures always say they are but crocodile tears, and this wounds me beyond all telling." Then the hyena said. You speak of your pain and your sorrow, but think of me also for a moment. I gaze at the beauty of the world, its wonders and its miracles, and out of sheer joy I laugh, even as the day laughs. And then the people of the jungle say it is but the laughter of a hyena. Going back to the、uh, duality thing, how fitting that the Gibran lyric that John Lennon appropriated for his song Julia reads: "Half of what I say is meaningless, but I say it so the other half may reach you." That's from Sand and Foam, and、uh, here's a little six degrees of Khalil for you: the mesmerizing guitar picking that Lennon used in Julia was taught to him by the folk singer Donovan when the two of them were seeking enlightenment from the Maharishi. Certainly, both Lennon and Donovan must have studied Gibran in India, and Donovan went on to write a song called "Sand and Foam," though it's about his trip to Mexico and doesn't seem to have anything to do with Khalil's book. Okay, three degrees. For more about Khalil Gibran, check www.leb.net forward slash Gibran, J-I-B-R-A-N, and oh no, excuse me, G-I-B-R-A-N. Pardon me. And now on to another poet. Born the same day as K.G. Carl Sandburg, a Pulitzer Prize-winning novelist, biographer, film critic, and folk music archivist, the son of Swedish immigrants, Sandburg quit school after eighth grade to help support his parents and six siblings. The road called, and he became a hobo, which shaped both his political views (he was an avowed socialist) and his folk musical tastes. Sandburg volunteered for the Spanish-American War, but was sent to Puerto Rico instead. Wow! If only our boys in Iraq were that lucky. You know, son, you're not Bahrain material, but、uh, you could just guard the outpost in the Bahamas for a few months. That would be fine. Well, anyway, 
Sandberg got out, went to college, and began working on his writing. Though he was already publishing small press poetry by 1904, Sandberg had to give it up for a while to support his new family. But in 1914, a group of his poems appeared in Poetry Magazine, which really launched him. Following the publications of Chicago Poems and Cornhuskers, Sandberg's publisher Alfred Harcourt—he's the H in H B J—was intrigued by his client's talent with Americana, politics, and sense of place. So he assigned Sandberg to do a massive biography of Abraham Lincoln. The tome would eventually reach six volumes and net Sandberg the Pulitzer Prize in 1940. He still wrote more verse and won another Pulitzer in 1951 for his complete poems collection. Sandberg died July 22, 1967, and he was buried where he was born, Galesburg, Illinois. His ashes placed beneath a red granite boulder called Remembrance Rock. One of the most famous Sandberg poems is The Fog. It seems to be a standard of English courses and creative writing classes, maybe because it's so teeny. But the description is pretty wonderful. The fog comes in on little cat feet. It sits looking over harbor and city, on silent haunches, and then moves on. That's the whole poem. But the image is certainly indelible. Sandberg's more socio-political writing would sound like this. Here's a Dickensian poem of his called "They Will Say." Of my city, the worst that men will ever say is this. You took little children away from the sun and the dew, and the glimmers that played in the grass under the great sky, and the reckless rain. You put them between walls to work, broken and smothered, for bread and wages, to eat dust in their throats and die empty-hearted, for a little handful of pay on a few Saturday nights. But I think Carl Sandburg got his poet laureate laurels with more homey work. The Our Towny Robert Frosty stuff, which also has its nostalgic pull, no question about it. We'll conclude our little Sandberg sandwich with Between Two Hills. Between two hills, the old town stands. The houses loom, and the roofs and trees, and the dusk and the dark, the damp and the dew are there. The prayers are said, and the people rest, for sleep is there, and the touch of dreams. Is over all. Nice. Happy birthday, Carl Sandburg. Khalil Gibran, January sixth. Whatever you think of their work, the very notion of a modern poet is something to be celebrated. Here's Donovan from the Troubadour collection, Sand and Foam. The sun was going down behind the tattoo tree, and the simple act. Of no stroke, put diamonds in the sea, and all because of the phosphorus there in quantity. As I dug it, taking me in Mexico. There in the valley of Scorpio, beneath the cross of jade. Smoking on the seashell pipe, the chip sees it made. We sat and we dreamed a while, the smugglers bringing wine. That crystal thought time in Mexico. Sitting in the chair of bamboo, sipping grenadine. Straining my eyes for a surfacing submarine. Kingdoms of ants walk across my feet. I'm a shaking in my seat in Mexico. Grasshoppers creaking. The velvet jungle night, microscopic circles in the fluid of my sight. Watching a black-eyed native girl cut and trim the lamp, 
Valentino Vamp in Mexico The sun was going down Behind a tattoo tree And simple act of a no stroke Put the diamonds in the sea And all because of the phosphorus there in quantity I dug you digging me in Mexico Hi folks! Dave Lefkowitz here from Dave's Gone By, and I want to tell you about a product, event, or service. I'm going to talk about it for half a minute or a minute. I'm going to make it really interesting, and all my listeners are going to go, hey, maybe I'll try this product, event, or service. It's called advertising or sponsorship, and it's easy, cost-effective, and just plain effective. To get your person, place, or thing, well, not thing, promote it on Dave's Gone By and reach listeners all over Brooklyn, Queens, Long Island, and the Tri-State area, just give us a call at 516-295-1511 or email us at davesgoneby at aol.com. Check our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash davesgoneby and see sponsorship opportunities, ad rates, and more. Again, the number, 516-295-1511. Insert your product, event, or service here. Back once more with Dave's Gone By, 8.46 p.m. on Sunday night, snowy Sunday night. Just a reminder about our giveaway. We have one pair of tickets left to see the 11-piece Klezmer Conservatory Band on Sunday, January 19th at the Forest Hills Jewish Center. They're one of the cornerstones of the 1980s Klezmer craze, so give us a call before 9 and say the secret word mushnick, and the seats are yours. Our phone number, again, the right number is 516-955-1240, 955-1240. If you don't win, but you want to buy tickets to the concert, call Ticketmaster at 212-307-7171. If you were with me at the start of the show... We played possibly my favorite song in the entire world, David Bowie's Heroes. I mentioned that, despite the hopeful lyrics, a real current of despair grips the performance. But since it's a new year, and my show's just been renewed for a bunch of weeks, yay, I think it's only fitting to play another version of the song that's rousing and joyful and thrilling. So it's Bowie again, from the 1977 live set called Stage. This is Heroes, the optimistic version, just for one night. I, I would be king, and you. You would be my queen For nothing Could keep us together But we could be down Forever and ever We could be heroes Just for one day Drink all the time Cause we're lovers And that is the fact Yes, we're lovers And that is that For nothing Could keep us together Though we may be them just for one day We can be heroes Just for one day I wish 
wish I could swim Like the dolphins Like the dolphins can swim Oh, nothing To drive them away Oh, we could beat them Just for one day We could be heroes Forever and ever What to say David Bowie there, Dave Lefkowitz here, finishing up this edition of Dave's Gone By with a live version of Heroes. For a playlist for this and previous episodes of Dave's Gone By, check our website, hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. We keep adding great stuff to the site, plus something very special this week. Yes, we've been given two more pair of tickets, first come, first served to the Klezmer Conservatory Band, playing Sunday, January 19th at Forest Hills Jewish Center. And I want to thank the uh, KCB for being so generous. To get the tickets, don't call the station now. Don't call the show. Show's over in a couple of minutes. This is at the Dave's Gone By website only. And now there's a catch. You have to be a member of or join the Bystanders Club. If you're already a member, just check your email for details. If you want to join the club, it's only $10, and you get all the cool club stuff, a bi-monthly newsletter, a weekly email, the best of audio tape, and opportunities for other discounts and free items. And the first two new or current club members who email will get tickets to the January 19th Klezmer Concert. All the details are on the website, hometown.aol.com forward slash Dave's Gone By. If you forget the URL, just Google search for Dave's Gone By, and we're right up on top. I want to thank 
uh, Jonathan Schlaff. Thanks to my special engineer tonight, Mr. Wonderful Stan. Hey, Stan. Wonderful, terrific, terrific job. My first 90-minute show, my first show with you. I think Paul will be back next week, so thank you, both of you. Uh, thanks to Engineer Joe. Listen to his show, Joe Sells Own Live, Saturday nights at 7.30. Although he forgot my promo yesterday, as my wife Joyce says, never trust a Republican. Also, Saturday nights, 5.30 to 6.30, new time slot. Don't miss Don Lewis hosting Entertainment Long Island about how to be a performer. Thanks to my guest, Dave Pace, and to his wonderful wife, Cheryl, my two favorite bugs in the bush. That wraps up this edition of Dave's Gone By, our 14th show. Here we are in the year. Please send your comments, suggestions, and Khalil gibberish to Dave's Gone By at AOL.com. See you next week, 7.30 Sunday night. Don't miss your new year going by. This is Dave Lefkowitz. Good night. Good start. And gone by. And I will walk and talk. And God is always with me. The views expressed in the previous program did not necessarily represent those of the staff, management, or owners of WGBB. Sweet thing.